She keeled over, just like that. It was just like that. I thought she'd fainted or something, but she was dead. He's lying. He killed her. I saw it from my window. You struck her with a rock. Shepard had served six weeks of his five to 15 years sentence for second degree murder when the matter was brought to my attention from an entirely unexpected quarter. Yeah? Well, send him in. I've been expecting him. Hello, Herb. Norm, how are you? Nice to see you. Sit down. Thank you. I suppose you're curious as to why I got you up here. No, not really. I imagine it has something to do with those patents. No, this has nothing to do with business. I want to see you alone. This is personal and urgent. Herb, my daughter has moved out of the house and gotten a job in town. Aline? Well, you ought to be very happy for her, Norm. Good for her to see how the other half lives. Yes, I'd be all for it if that was why she left. But uh, I'm afraid Eileen is going to disown me unless I do something to help Tom Shepard. Tom Shepard, isn't he that young executive of yours who was convicted of... Well, how'd you get mixed up with him? Well, it's my fault. I was impressed with the boy. You know, clean cut, good education, terrific drive. I took him home to meet her. Sounds like you when you were a little bit younger, Norm. Well, the point is, she's convinced of his innocence. On what grounds? She's in love with him. That's what grounds. Oh, I had a battle on my hand trying to keep her away from that trial. I was worried sick for fear they'd drag her name into the papers. Do you think he's guilty, Norm? What difference does it make? If something isn't done, I'd lose my daughter. Well, maybe Eileen was right. You could have retained the best criminal lawyer in town. Why didn't you? Well, his family already employed capable counsel. And besides, I didn't want her name dragged into a scandal. But now, Herb, you've got to look into it. For Eileen's sake, she's fond of you. Ever since she was a little child, she's thought you were the greatest lawyer in the world. Norm, I've known Eileen ever since she was a child, but I just don't have the time. All I'm asking you to do is look into it. Don't you understand? If you report back that this case is hopeless, she'll believe you. But what if I find something that points to his innocence? Well, I'm not expecting miracles. Herb, since my wife died, Eileen is all that I have. I don't know what in the world I'll do without her. A man can be a giant in industry, but if he has no one to love, there's not much point to his success. A man like Winfield seldom begs. When he does, he can't just turn away. I agreed to talk to Eileen, nothing more. Eileen had found a job as a secretary. She was busy, but agreed to meet me for lunch. Mr. Maris, I'm so happy to see you. Eileen Winfield wanted no peace treaty with her father, but she was eager to talk about Tom Shepard. Are you going to help Tom? 
Is he worth helping? Same LP record and such stereophonic righteousness. But if you're saying your father's tried to prejudice me, you're wrong. He never has. Look, Mr. Maris, I know Tom had big ideas. When we first started a date, he probably had an eye on the executive suite as well as the bride. But somewhere along the line, he changed. Tom's not ruthless. He's warm and he's very tender. Once you break through his defense. Well, he's aggressive, but what's wrong with that? Nothing. Unless the taste of success gets too rich for his blood, and if the drives get out of hand, and he doesn't let anything stand in the way, the next thing you know, you'll read the results in the tabloids. Why did you come here, Mr. Maris, if you're just so sure he's guilty? Eileen, did you know he was two-timing you with Betty King? <laughs> Tell me all about her on our second date. He was through with her. He told me he didn't kill her, and I believe him. And he told a jury he didn't kill her, and they didn't believe him. But juries can't make mistakes. And girls in love can't make mistakes. They're uh, never prejudiced, always clear-eyed. All right, look, don't take my word for it. You go and talk to him yourself, just once. Then if you still don't believe him, you can for... Please, Mr. Maris, will you just see him? It's one afternoon out of your life. It's everything to Tom and, and me. All right. Oh, I'm so glad. How about something to eat, huh? I love it. Waitress? There was no doubting Eileen's conviction. When she said it was everything to her, she meant it. Lieutenant Weston had been the arresting officer. Tom Shepard had been one of his easy cases. Once in a while, he had a real tough one. Uh, what was that, lady? You say some children are playing cowboys and Indians in the street, and they annoy you, huh? Oh, yes, some things annoy me, too, lady. I'll send a man right out. Thank you. Oh, good day, Counselor. Lieutenant, how are you? And to what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? A guy by the name of Tom Shepard. Tom Shepard? Why, uh, have you got something new on him? The jury brought in a verdict in less time it takes to see a ball game. How much do you remember about the details? As they say, I was at the scene of the crime. Did you see the actual incident? No. But there are people who did. Before Tom Shepard killed this Betty King, they were seen in a bar fighting like cats and dogs. Witness to that, Jake Ryan, the bartender. Witness to the killing, Mrs. Caffrey. She saw Tom strike Betty with a rock. Another witness, the girl who sells tickets at the theater. She didn't see him hit her, but he, she saw the girl fall. Who's retaining you on this case? Shepard's family? Norman Winfield. Oh, Shepard's boss. Your boss. My client. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Maris. What is your client trying to prove? That the company stands by its boys through thick and thin? Or is this fee tax deductible? Lieutenant, off the record, Winfield's daughter is the other girl in the case. So? Honestly, Herb, you think it's fair to the boy getting his hopes up? And you know there's nothing you can do to help him? A little suffering won't hurt. Not if we can help the boy in the end. Now, can I see the records? Why not? They're public. You're a taxpayer, so is your boss. I mean, client. I did no gentlemanly sparring with Tom Shepard. With everything depending on how he impressed me, I knew I had to give him a rough going over. Sit down. The bartender said you threatened to break Betty's neck if she went to Eileen's father. Well, I didn't mean it. I was so burned up, I didn't know exactly what I was saying. A man that angry could kill without knowing what he was doing. I know what I was doing. Sure, you knew if Betty went to Mr. Winfield, your marriage and big shot plans would be off. That's not true. So you had to act fast. You picked up a rock. Look, I swear I didn't. I never even laid a hand on her to help me. Betty struck at me. That explains Betty's death. She struck you, huh? I put up my hand to keep her from hitting me. On this wild theory, you want me to help you? No. Because I'm innocent. Anyway, I didn't ask for your help. Not directly. You worked on Eileen. You played on her sympathies. You're dead wrong. I begged Eileen to stay away from me. Why, an ambitious man shouldn't be shy of influence. Now, look, Mr. Maris, you listen to me. 
I didn't want Eileen's reputation hurt. She happens to be a very fine person. Well, I'm glad to see you've got a shred of decency. Or are you playing on my sympathy, huh? Well, I doubt if that's possible. Oh, I don't know. Obviously, you got me pegged as a number one heel. All right. Maybe I am. Maybe I had my eyes set on the main chance. But somewhere along the way, I fell in love. If you don't believe that, you are wasting your time. The medical report established blow on the head as the cause of death. Even your attorney was unable to shake the expert witness on that point. My attorney did the best he could. He was a classmate of mine. What about your family? Didn't they help you? Help me? How could they? I was supporting them. Tom, I'm going to do what I can for you. I'm, I'm sorry I gave you such a rough time, but sometimes that's the quickest and surest way of getting to know somebody. I understand, Mr. Maris. Oh, uh, don't raise your hopes too high. Guard, we've got a lot to do. I'm not too sure we can do it. to drop by. Not at all. It's on my way home. I spoke to your daughter and Tom Shepard. I'm going ahead with the investigation. I like the boy. He's forthright and intelligent. I've got a feeling he's telling the truth. Well, that's fine, Herb. That's fine. Uh, when you get back from Washington, you get right on it. The patents? I'm not going to Washington. I'm turning it over to my correspondence there. Herb, I retain you as my general counsel because of my confidence in your ability. Now, I expect you to handle my affairs personally, not through a correspondent. The patents will have to wait. The boy's case is urgent. There's an investigation. And if I come up with something new, I want to move for a new trial immediately. Herb, I realize that you take great pride in this sort of thing. But is it necessary to become a wild-eyed fanatic about it? A boy's in prison that shouldn't be there. In your opinion. You solicited my opinion. Why'd you ask me to get into this case? Well, I certainly didn't expect you to go off half-cocked. I can understand Eileen being taken in by a smooth charm, but not you, Herb. You're a shrewd lawyer. And I'll tell you something else. I don't care what happens to Shepard. He's no good. He's a cold-blooded climber, a fortune hunter. But not a murderer. The jury found otherwise. You examine the facts for yourself. I will. But in the meantime, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. All you've got is the word of a rank opportunist who's lying to save his own skin. And for that, you're tossing away a generous retainer and the friendship of half a lifetime. I had the feeling I'd taken the case six weeks too late. Even the original witnesses were hard to track down. Jake Ryan, the bartender at the Golden Lion, who'd overheard the quarrel between Tom and Betty, had quit a few weeks after the trial. The proprietor had no idea where he worked now or where he lived. It was easier finding Mrs. Caffrey, the woman in the window, whose testimony had been the key to the prosecution's case. She'd been a talkative witness on the stand, almost as if her day in court was her opportunity to impress the world. She was happy to have an unexpected caller. Yes. Miss Caffrey? Yes. I wonder if I could talk to you for a minute. Well, uh, come in, please. Thank you. Um, would you sit down? Oh, uh, please excuse the looks of the place. I, I haven't had a chance to clean up yet. You see, I, I usually do the marketing please first. Please don't apologize, Mrs. Caffrey. I understand. I, I'd i like to talk to you about the Tom Shepard case. Oh, I should have guessed it. Ever since the trial, reporters, 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 read us in the newspapers and, and in the detective magazines. I, I just did my duty. I, I don't see why they consider me so important. Oh, you are important, Mrs. Caffrey, very important. Tom Shepard's future depends on you. Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Maris. Herb Maris. You're a lawyer. Uh, who sent you? I represent Tom Shepard. I told that lawyer in court what I saw. I'm sorry for the young man. Maybe, maybe he didn't mean to do it, but I saw him kill that girl. Mr. 
Did you ever see a person killed before your own eyes? I still get nightmares. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your testimony. I told the truth in court. Now, the jury believed me, and so did the judge. He said I made a fine witness. Well, I'm sure you did, Mrs. Caffrey. It's not I, a question I, of whether I'm quite you... busy, Mr. Uh, Maris. Would you mind very much? Thank you for talking to me. Whatever her reasons, Mrs. Caffrey wasn't about to take any chances with her importance as a star witness, even if it meant Tom Shepard would have to spend 15 years in prison. But somehow, I knew she was wrong. It wasn't that simple. Even the coroner had had to use some impressive-sounding words. It was time to get his definition of them. Dr. Phillips, at the trial, you certified cause of death, I quote, a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. So the record shows, Mr. Maris. Doctor, what is an aneurysm? It's a sac or swelling caused by the dilation of an artery and the tissues around it. Thank you, Doctor. You further testified this ruptured aneurysm was caused by a blow on the head. I stated as my expert opinion that it could have been caused by a blow on the head. Were there any marks? Mm, yes, the laceration and bruise over the left ear. But could it have been caused by a fall? Mm, yes. Then there could have been other causes. Oh, of course. An aneurysm could even be a chronic condition over a long period of time. Would an autopsy uh, reveal such a chronic condition? Well, the record doesn't indicate it. Of course, the autopsy was only begun by me. It was completed by one of my deputies. I see. But in the case of a prolonged chronic condition, a fatal rupture would not necessarily have to result from a blow or a, an act of violence, would it? No. Theoretically, it could even be caused by any sudden excitement that might increase the blood pressure. Did you tell them any of this at the trial? No. Why not? I wasn't asked. I'm sorry, but you'll have to excuse me now. Now, six weeks after Tom Shepard's trial, Dr. Phillips had finally given an answer that opened a door. It was time to find out more about Betty King. She'd worked for an insurance company, and her supervisor recalled that on one occasion she'd fainted and a nearby industrial doctor had been summoned. His name was Flynn. When she told me she'd had these fainting and dizzy spells before, of course, I knew something was wrong. I made her have a complete medical checkup. And the results? Well, Mr. Maris, I'm a workman's compensation doctor, a general practitioner. So naturally, I call in a specialist. A uh, cerebral aneurysm. Doctor. Yes? Was it a chronic condition? Yes, it was. What we call a Barry's aneurysm. I wanted to slow down and live quietly, but, uh, well, she was an amazing girl, Mr. Maris. A lot of spunk. Said life was no fun unless you lived it up to the hilt. Would you be willing to testify as to her medical history and affidavit? Why, yes. Thank you, Doctor. One thing more. I'd like to ask you just one more question. Go ahead, shoot. You read about your patient's death in the newspapers, didn't you? Yes. Why didn't you tell the district attorney about her condition? Well, I was going to until I read that her boyfriend had clobbered over the rock. Now, that's enough to kill anybody, sick or well. And he had a motive to murder her. Lieutenant Weston had located Jake Ryan for me. He was working in a bowling alley out on the north side. Yeah, I remember the couple. How could I ever forget them? I was sitting down at the end of the bar. She was getting a little noisy, kind of out of line. He was trying to shush her up. I just burned her up all the more. Hey, what are you doing this for? Kicks, headlines or something? Well, maybe you like the DA job, huh? I told you why, Ryan. Yeah, you told me. It sounds a little fishy to me. You testified Shepard started out without paying his bill and you ran after him. No, I didn't run after him at all. I just yelled across as he was going out, that's all. He whipped out his wallet, pulled out a five-dollar bill and threw it at me and busted out the door. He was in such a hurry to catch up with the dame, he didn't have time to put the wallet back in his pocket. Say that again. 
I said he was in such a hurry to catch up with the Dane, he didn't have time to put the wallet back in his pocket. He just busted out the door. Thanks. Thanks very much. Ryan said you started out after without paying for your drinks. Is that true? No, he's wrong. I paid up. How? Yeah, with cash, of course. Always carry your cash in your pocket? No, I change in my pocket. I, I carry my bills in my wallet. Uh, now, look. I took my wallet out of my pocket. And I, I tossed a bill on the counter, then I, I ran out into the... I don't see what connection... What did you do with your wallet? I put it back in my pocket, I guess. You guess? Don't you know? Well, not exactly. I was in a hurry to catch up with Betty. This wallet may be the most important matter of your life. I don't see the connection. Well, let's try another approach. After you left the bar, did you notice the condition of the street? Mrs. Caffrey testified there was a pile of broken concrete. Tell me what you know, not what Mrs. Caffrey said. She also testified you picked up a rock from that pile, and that convicted you. Well, that's a lie. I picked up my wallet. You know what you just said? Sure. I tripped and dropped it on the pile. I remember distinctly, and I was stooping to pick it up. I still had it in my hand when Betty tried to hit me. Then you couldn't have put it back in your pocket. Where were my brains? How could I have forgotten a thing like that? Too bad you did. Guard! Now get this, Weston. The boy runs out of the bar, dropping his wall. He picks it up. The girl swings at him. He uses it to protect himself. The girl drops dead from excitement, strikes her head as she falls. And do you buy it? Well, along with Dr. Flynn's affidavit, looks like I have no choice. Thanks, Lieutenant. If Flynn had spoken up when he read about Betty King in the newspaper, there wouldn't be any need of this affidavit. For all Flynn knew, Shepard really did club her with a rock. Lieutenant, listen to me. It's people like Flynn keeping his mouth shut Letting Mrs. Caffrey, a careless witness, do a seeing for him. People like Coroner Phillips waiting to be asked. And people like Norman Winfield letting his personal prejudices get in the way. The clobbered Tom Shepard. All right, Counselor. What's the answer? All of it adds up to one thing. A man in prison. Not because of something he did, but because of what these people didn't do. again. Exactly the same, just exactly, except she's not there now. What are you talking about, Mrs. Caffrey? Well, you see, I I heard this girl scream, and then I hurried to the window just in time to see this man pick up a rock and hit the girl on the head. It was exactly the way that man Shepard did. Are you sure, Mrs. Caffrey? Of course I'm sure. The girl fell on those rocks. And, and then I, I tried to get the police, and then, and then you came in. Would you say he struck the girl as hard as Tom Shepard did? Oh, yes. It was just the way it happened before. It was awful. Come in. Mrs. Caffrey, Eileen and Mike were the two people you saw outside your window a moment ago. Mike, show Mrs. Caffrey what you had in your hand. Eileen, did Mike lay a finger on you? Not once. What kind of a trick is this? No trick at all, Mrs. Caffrey. A boy by the name of Tom Shepard is in prison because you thought he hit a girl with a rock. Now, you just saw the same thing happen, and not with a rock at all, and nobody was even touched. Well, I thought I... Well, if he didn't hit her, then what did she die of? From a very old, serious illness. What can I do to... Never mind, Mrs. Caffrey. I think you've already done it. Well, Counselor, you booted home a long shot. 
with your help lieutenant in the home stretch